We know that the executive branch of the government essentially had their boot on the neck of these people at Twitter. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall for The Spectator. Today I'm in New York speaking with David Zweig, musician, author, novelist, uh, lecturer, but crucially for this interview, one of the journalists behind the Twitter files. And uh, well, David, thank you so much for spending spending the uh, uh, this next hour or so with me uh, discussing all these things. Glad to be here. Um, uh, so uh, I want to get into the Twitter files, and at the moment, uh, it's being debated in Congress, as I understand, with the the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, and specifically some of your work has been uh, debated or, or uh, uh, looked into. We'll get into that and, and the significance of that. And I'm curious to ask about the, the Twitter files experience I- itself. But before all of that, I think it's worth understanding why you were invited. And it's, I think it's because of your uh, reporting through COVID. So there are a few issues through COVID that um, that made you sort of a heterodox journalist, really. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about some of those uh, topics. Sure, yeah. Um, well, the Twitter files were happening. Matt Taibbi was, um, you know, had put out at least one or a few. And then I saw that Barry Weiss um, was also invited to, you know, to, to go to um, to go to Twitter and, and report. And, you know, and she now has kind of a media empire. So it's not just Barry, but it's, you know, a variety of journalists who work for or with her. And um, so I knew Barry and some editors who knew her and I, and I emailed them and said, hey, you know, um, I noticed you guys have access to the Twitter files. I just want to suggest a few things, it, you know, and I, I was very sheepish. I almost felt apologetic. I was like, just in case um, you want to look into X, Y, or Z related to COVID, here's what I would do. Da, 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 da. I would look into this. You know, 10 minutes later, I get a response. Can you drop everything and get on a flight to San Francisco? I said, okay. So um, it was so, you know, and they asked me to come out. I think I am considered one one of the few journalists, if not the only one, who has really done a tremendous amount of investigative reporting related to the underlying science um, that that has been used to justify a lot of pandemic policies. Mm. And I've done so, I should say there are plenty of journalists doing that. I think I'm considered one of the only ones or the only one who's done so at a lot of what are considered sort of mainstream and legacy um, publications Mm. like New York Magazine, The Atlantic, Mm. um, even had a piece in the New York Times early on during the pandemic. So so I think because of that, work that I had been doing for several years at that point. Um, and, and because I knew Barry, I had written for, for her earlier, they brought me out to, they were like, you're the guy we want to be looking into COVID. Um, why why do you think them. those mainstream uh, publications took your work on when, when they didn't take many sort of mm. counter narrative uh, reports on? Yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, well, I've been writing for a lot of them for years. Mm-hmm. So I already knew um, editors um, at a variety of publications. But the interesting thing is, I mean, they I, I've always been a freelancer. Um, so, you know, and as an independent journalist, it's it's a totally different thing than they have, you know, all these places have large staffs <laughs> of staff writers. So there's a couple interesting threads there, which one is why weren't any of the staff members writing from the same perspective that I was writing from. Uh-huh. And then as a separate issue, um, I've been very fortunate that there's been at least a small ha- uh, number of editors who I know who are sympathetic to what I was saying that I, I like everyone, I make mistakes, uh-huh. but I try to be incredibly meticulous uh-huh. and thorough with my reporting. And um, my editor, uh, Daniel Engber, who I'd worked with at Wired, and now he's at The Atlantic, for example, um, Jebediah Reed at New York, and some others. You know, when I pitch them something very early on in the beginning, I try to lay out a case where it's inarguable, mm-hmm. you know, at least in my mind, where I'm like, here's what I'd like to write about. The schools are closed um, in America, the entire country. This has never happened before. They are opening throughout Europe. This was at the end of April, beginning of May. Mm. Why? 
and no one else, as far as I could see, was writing it. I was at work um, on a book at the time about a totally different topic because, of course, <laughs> the pandemic had just started, so I wouldn't be writing about that. I was writing a, um, a nonfiction book. I was under contract, um, and I found myself completely unable to concentrate on the book mm. because what was happening around me seemed slightly crazy. And my sort of my default is to always go to the source. I spent many years as a fact checker at magazines, um, and now fact checking is this sort of like politicized activity. But back then, um, the the job was just for nerds like me who just wanted to and enjoyed the process of poking holes in things. You read, someone spends all this time writing this beautiful article and the editor edits, and you get to go in and rip it, huh? rip it apart and be like, is this true? Uh -huh. And the main thing that I learned in that training is you can't just take, if something, the backup, the source for a statement shouldn't be or cannot simply be the New York Times or some other publication. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the source. And in, in some sense, you're never done fact checking. You're just, you can always go one layer deeper. Even if you speak to the person who made some statement, you then have to find out, well, is it true what they said? You know, and then you, so that partly that's my brain, the way I work. I'm always seeing the sort of errors and things. And partly it's through that sort of training of doing that work all the time. Those two things together my mindset is I'm always curious and wondering, well, is this true what they're telling me? But should, David, shouldn't, isn't that, shouldn't that be normal? Shouldn't all journalists be I, acting that behavior? I, that well, I mean, well, here's the thing. And this is a big part of the book that I'm writing now about um, American schools during the pandemic, um, is that one of the things you saw or over and over in all sorts of publications and in you know TV news and everywhere else is time and again, that um, they would quote experts saying whatever, you know, the experts say X, Y, or Z, or they would interview a few people, an infectious disease person, whatever, saying, you know, X, Y, or Z opinion about something. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, but the articles weren't actually, well, what is the underlying evidence for that? Just because this person is telling me this, that doesn't mean it's true. And that goes back to that fact-checking brain I have and this mindset where I'm always a little bit skeptical mm. of everything that people are telling me. And so in the beginning, we were told all these things and they made intuitive sense. There is a virus that's happening. I was very frightened. I wanted my kids home. You know, we all tried to stay, you know, somewhat isolated from other people. But very early on, we knew the data out of China was very clear. And then the data that started coming out of Europe was very clear that children were at extraordinarily low risk. Mm -hmm. So we knew this. There was no ambiguity about it. And there were, and, and more broadly, the age gradient of risk. It was clear from early on what was happening. Mm. Um, and nevertheless, the schools were closed. And then it got even worse where the schools were opening in places and they remained closed in America. Mm -hmm. And the reason given, if a reason was given at all, was, well, that's Europe. That's different than here. Uh -huh. And I asked why yeah why is it different what does that mean exactly and basically what i've been doing now for the past couple of years aside from my reporting in articles is in writing this book i just keep asking why um and digging deeper and deeper and really i think all this is about empiricism it's about is this thing that you're told can you observe it yourself can, and if you can't observe it yourself, is there something concrete that actually underlies mm -hmm. what they're telling you? Um, so to me, that that's kind of what it comes down to. It's like, what is the empirical evidence actually telling us? So if it wasn't empirical evidence that they were making their decisions based off of, what was the why? Why were they keeping the schools closed here in America? Well, that's that's a very, I have a, probably like a thousand page book that's going to answer that question. What is the, the why? But I mean... I think in the broad strokes, it, it has to do with, um, you know, what they would call in, in philosophy is called an appeal to authority, which is um, like I was talking about a moment ago, experts were saying this and that's sufficient when the expert says this and there, this, there is this sort of astonishing lack of curiosity, I think, mm -hmm. from a lot of journalists. I don't blame regular people. For, for saying the CDC is telling me blah, blah, blah. Okay, most people, they have jobs, they're dealing with their kids, they're doing whatever. That's not their 
obligation necessarily. I'd like for regular people to be more curious, but I appreciate why that's there. But for someone like me, uh -huh. that's my obligation to dig into it. And certainly more so than me, I I'm just an independent journalist. This wasn't even my beat necessarily. I don't understand this sort of what, it, what, in my view, was this incredible lack of curiosity from people where this was their job, this was their beat to dig into this stuff. And you know, one of the things that I often think about, and that I'm writing about in my book, is that um, you know, liberals in general, of which I think I still am a liberal and count my have counted myself as for for many years, my adult life, and, and liberals and also journalists. Um, have always had like a really strong degree of skepticism toward large institutions, the government, the military, big business, religion, these large institutions of society. Yet somehow, in my view, that skepticism vaporized mm. um, when it came to the pandemic and what the public health authorities were telling us. Well, it did here in New York, but there's other mm. parts of the country where, in fact, no, the, the tradition of, of questioning government or big government True. very much maintained. And actually we saw it split pretty much along political lines. It did. And then that created, you know, the circumstance that I feel like you've found yourself in uh -huh. as well. And you know why, why you and I are talking, which is that if you were politically, to say, and I don't, and by the way, I don't think of myself as left or right politically. I have a diverse range of views on a wide range of complicated mm -hmm. topics. Nevertheless, I aligned myself as a Democrat and as a liberal for most of my adult life. And for people like me, or if I can include you in this, to that there was this sort of like, you know, hard line yeah. drawn and you couldn't step over that line. Yeah. And so what's been fascinating is from the very beginning, when the first piece I published in like the first week of May of 2020 through until now, but, but particularly in the beginning that I would get... I mean, almost every day I get emails or messages from people saying, hey, you know, I'm like you, I, I'm a liberal or I voted, you know, they, they, oftentimes it's very funny, but in the beginning in particular, anytime I would speak with, um, you know, an infectious disease doctor or, or, or some other person in public health or even regular people, nine out of 10 times, the conversation would start with this preamble that the person... I need to let you know, I voted for Obama and, and I, you know, I hate Trump and I've been a liberal, but, and then dot, dot, dot. And like, and that's how, what a remarkable commentary on our culture and on the left. What a commentary that is about what the modern left is mm -hmm. today, that people, including like highly credentialed, very um, doctors who work at very prestigious, you know, medical schools in, in the country and, and abroad, that people felt the need to have this sort of like apologia, you know, before this, this preemptive kind of throat clearing, before we could then get down to business and talk. Um, that is diminished dramatically over the last three years, but it still exists to some extent now. Um, and, and I think it's like a really remarkable commentary, the yeah. fact that people feel that, I don't know if you, if you sort of feel the I, need I'm to kind of, of announce I do, own, I, right. for me, I, you know, I was brought up canvassing for the Liberal Democrat Party in the UK, which is basically a centrist party, mm -hmm. and very much come from a liberal background and, and get all sorts of uh, attacks. And in fact, only this week you we were called by Senator Scott Wiener in California, uh, one of Elon Musk's right-wing conspiracy propaganda machine stooges or something like that. <laughs> exactly. It's an example of it. And, and I've had equivalent stuff. It's, it's, so you say it's diminished over the last three years. I, I'm not <laughs> fully not, convinced that you point it out has that. diminished right. over the last well, three years. And well, and the interesting thing is, um, I, I replied to him, because, you know, when you have a, a very high-level politician calling you out, you know, on, on a platform like Twitter, yeah, it probably behooves you to reply sometimes. And, and I said... Yeah. I don't remember but verbatim, but I essentially wrote back to him and I said, you know, hey, thanks, Senator. Um, what exactly in my reporting is right wing? What exactly in my reporting was misleading or false uh -huh. to say that I'm part of a propaganda machine? And you know what his response was? What? He didn't respond. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, so it, it's just so... The environment still exists. That guy obviously has a motive to 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 brand anyone that's against 
sort of what he perceives to be the appropriate thing as the bad people. Mm. And that's just been this whole dynamic, you know, in COVID and then in obviously a variety of other, you know, cultural areas. Anytime you question something, you're automatically on the wrong team. Yeah. You know, so I've noticed that, by the way, it's not just the the left or progressive Democrats. Do it. The conservatives do it just as much. You're right. And, you're right. I think I'm so... They certainly do it anyway. I think I'm more sensitive and more aware of the left doing it only because that felt like my tribe mm -hmm. for my adult life. So you're right. And you're right to point out that, that, you know, the, the conservatives and, and right now, they are just as tribal in, in their own thing. And, you know, people can't, um, you know, can't be disloyal to them either. Um, I think just, at, I felt a sense and still do feel a sense of, of, and, and of betrayal almost like I, an astonishment. I'll, so I had this moment, um, I wrote a piece um, for The Atlantic about a masking study in schools in Arizona that was published by, in, by the CDC in their journal, MMWR. And the study, I won't get into the boring granular details, but the study was just terminally flawed. There, it wasn't just, oh, there's problems with the methodology. There were factual errors in the study. And I did an extensive investigation into this because this was important. This was being used to justify policy. Mm. Um, and you can't do that <laughs> when, when there are errors. And I was emailing back and forth with the authors of the study, as well as the editors at the CDC's journal. I said, look, there are errors here. This is what they are. I'm getting information. This isn't my opinion. Mm -hmm. This is I'm getting information from the state of Arizona, from the county health departments. They are giving me data that's different from what you have in your study. Mm. Are you telling me that the state of Arizona is wrong? You know, with the data like that. And I wrote with them, I wrote to them and said- To the know, CDC. To the CDC and to the editors of, of, the, of the journal put out by, and the authors of the study. And I said, you know, this is the information I have from the state. Um, it's different from what you have in the study. And they wrote back to me and said, there are no errors. And it was this, moment where something like broke in my head. I had already been reporting on science and COVID related matters, you know, throughout the pandemic, but it was this moment where I couldn't believe that a, a health authority, I imagined somewhere like the CIA or, or, or some other, you know, or some big corporation or something, they have invested interests in, in kind of, you know, lying or at least snowballing certain things. But I couldn't believe what happened that I'm like, but these people know that this is untrue. They know this is not true. Um, what's in this study? And that night I was like, kind of like curled in a ball, like, and, and I had this like incredible migraine and my wife was talking to me and I was like almost on the verge of tears. It's embarrassing to admit, but it was just this moment, this sense of, of like betrayal and almost this like, I couldn't believe that I was this naive before, but I never expected people within public health to actually behave in this manner. Well, the implication, if you, if you think that they knew, is that it's not incompetence, actually, it's ideology. Do you think that's fair? So I think about this all the time, you know, in relation to that specific incident, but more broadly, you know, a lot of the things that Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC says are incorrect. They're just, they're just false uh, or, or at best one could say misleading. Mm -hmm. And, and I talk with, um, people who are in the public health field. I'm friends with, I, I, yeah, I would say I'm friendly, you know, I'm friends with now I'm in these text groups with various infectious disease doctors at, you know, Ivy League uh, medical schools and with immunologists at top hospitals. So I'm in these text groups with these people. We chat every day and we are always talking about, I always ask them like, she knows, right? You know, or someone else or Fauci knows this, right? And we're always trying to figure out whether it is and, and is this on purpose or is it incompetence or is it something else? And I think that it's this weird mix of all of them together where, I, you know, human beings have motivated reasoning. And for a variety of reasons, they want and need to believe certain things to be true. Mm -hmm. And 
when you want and need something to be true, you are able of convincing yourself of all sorts, you know, it's, it's confirmation bias. Um, this is often referred to when you're looking at data or evidence, you are, you have a bias mm -hmm. toward confirming what you already believe. Um, and there's some research on this, that the smarter someone is, the more susceptible they are to this. Because when you're really bright and you are in a particular field, you have the ability to rationalize all, yeah. any way you want. <clears throat> yeah. So that's my working theory is that I think most of these people in their minds are not purposefully saying something that's untrue. Although I think some of them are. Some of them are. If you're in a position in politics and right. you make policy based on certain things and you're, you're kind of career is almost tied up in, in being right. So you have to be right, right. And, and push it for your own sake. I try to be generous though, and say that at least for most of them, most of the time, mm -hmm. I think there's some sort of very, very profound motivated reasoning. And that when you're intelligent, you are able to rationalize all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we've observed over and over. Yeah. Um, and I think that ties into what I was saying before about you know empiricism. And like, you can believe something, but if the evidence is showing you something else, or if there is a lack of evidence behind what you believe, that matters. And that's the thing I picked up on with masks. I mean, I don't have a particular interest in masks. <laughs> it's nothing I've been, but the evidence base behind community masking as an effective mitigation measure is at best, mixed and incredibly weak. And that is from the CDC itself. Uh -huh. That is from um, the Cochrane Review out of, um, out of Britain, which is considered the, you know, the, the eminent um, organization that does these um, systematic reviews of um, randomized control trials. Prior to the pandemic, they said, this is what the, the, all the aggregate of evidence said. Wow. This, this particular thing, people wearing masks in a community setting, it's just not particularly effective. And so it's a remarkable moment when you have um, the government and you know people like Anthony Fauci and these other people telling you all of a sudden magically that this is going to work when none of the evidence supported that. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work, but it means we lacked evidence to, to say, and they spoke with such certainty. And you were a piece of garbage if you questioned this, only the asshole Republicans yeah. and the bad people um, weren't wearing masks or even were questioning whether this was a good idea. But yet that's exactly what, what the evidence base pointed toward was this is not necessarily an effective um, uh, measure at the community level. I actually remember being here in New York uh, at, it, during the, the pandemic, I can't remember exactly when, and walking down the street, in the middle of the street without a mask and being hissed at, <laughs> hissed at. <laughs> By, an, uh, by someone else who was about four meters away from right. it. There's no danger. There was a, kind of something was uh, really wrong there. But there was another uh, topic which which has reared its head again, which you were, I think, very early on. It's myocarditis and the empiricism around that. And and I think it was as early as December 2020, you were writing about that and, and the data, particularly on teenagers, that actually it was a wash uh, uh, in, in terms of taking the vaccine and... and the, uh, the 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 likelihood of actually get you know it preventing infection versus you uh, getting myocarditis. Do, do you feel now with with the stories about excess deaths that you were vindicated in, in that, or do you feel sort of um, any disappointment about how that information was received? Your reporting. Well, um, yes, I, I've been on this from the beginning. Um, I interviewed the Israeli scientist who put out the initial um, report that kind of really made it in the news, um, where they found a, a rate of between one in 3,000 or one in 6,000 for young males um, who were, who were um, getting vaccinated. So this was the initial thing I was you know, texting with this guy in Israel trying to, I don't even know how I was able to connect with him, but it was, it was an amazing moment. And um, so I've been following it very closely and have written a handful of pieces um, since then. Um, I will say this regarding the, the, the deaths and stuff now, which is we don't know. Um, again, this gets back to that there is, because there weren't properly done randomized trials um, with, of sufficient power, which means generally like with enough people, 
for young people, the pool is already mixed at this point. Almost everyone has already had COVID and an, you know, an incredibly high number of people have been vaccinated. So I think it is wrong to automatically point to the vaccine. Mm. Um, when people do that and say, oh, it's the vaccine. You know, um, and conversely, it's also wrong where the other side where people say, it's from COVID that this is happening. Um, and even on top of that, even the numbers themselves, as far as what is excess death, those are extrapolations. Um, when we talk about excess death numbers, we don't really know because it's it's made, uh, they're made using by modeling where scientists look at, well, how many people die each year normally? And then they model what's going to happen, you know, what should happen the next year, but they have to account for a difference in population numbers. You know, it, it, it's a, it's a projection. It's not an exact thing. So you have all these different moving pieces from everyone being vaccinated, everyone having COVID, the, the numbers themselves are an extrapolation. So I think People need to be very careful about speaking with certainty in whatever direction related to that. It doesn't mean that it's definitively not, uh, you know, related to the vaccine in some cases. Um, and there's a lot of evidence, I think, that suggests that is the case. Um, there's this incredible study out of Germany where they um, where they were um, looking at um, cadavers and, and they this I forget what the number. I think it was four out of sixteen or four out of twenty. They found. Um, this sort of myocardial um, uh, damage in the hearts in, in young people, and it was immediately after vaccination. So until, unless you're doing that type of analysis, it's very hard to know um, definitively one way or the other. But there, but that study and a variety of others certainly are are suggestive that something's going on. I, I won't get into. You too sound many a little more. bit on the fence on the on the issue, but I'm not on the fence regarding this. I, I, the excess death thing is is too complicated, in my view, for the reasons I just mentioned. But what I'm not on the fence about is the evidence is very clear, dating back to this initial Israeli um, study that came out, that young people and far and away young men, um, roughly between like age 16 and 24, but, it, but it, you know, it, it tapers off after that, are at an elevated risk for myocarditis mm -hmm. um, following an mRNA vaccine. There's no ambiguity about that. The CDC w would readily admit, I mean, you can look at the slides um, that are shown in the CDC's, um, in their advisory committee uh, meetings and in the FDA uh, meetings as well. So there's no ambiguity about that. Um, what they claim is that despite that risk, it is still worth it um, for a young person to get vaccinated. Um, and there are a number, and an, I think an increasing number of highly credentialed uh, people in the field who would be, who would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Who would say, you know, and there was a study that just came out recently, but there have been many that yet another study that found once you've been infected, you have a very robust um, immune protection um, against the next, you know, exposure to the virus. Getting infected. That doesn't mean that it was a bad idea for elderly people and people at risk to get vaccinated in the beginning. In fact, it was probably a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, you want the first time you're exposed to the virus to be a time where it's where it's a relatively controlled experience through a vaccination. Um, but almost every young person has already had COVID, and the no, there's as far as I'm aware, there is no evidence as of today that getting an an additional vaccine dose after you've already been infected has any sort of meaningful difference in reducing um, the, the uh, incidence of severe disease. That it's just that is what the evidence shows. Um, and there's study after study in places like the New England Journal of Medicine and elsewhere that support that. And you know, in places like Britain and elsewhere in Europe, their vaccine policies are very different from what they are in the U.S. The fascinating thing, and you know, our whole conversation, in my mind, it all ties together, whether it's with school closures, whether it's with masking, whether it's with vaccines. The US, um, among sort of like Western nations, I think, has been uniquely aggressive in their approach to most of these things. We are the only country that masked two-year-olds. Um, there is no randomized trial evidence that shows that this is beneficial for a two-year-old. You know what? What is the what is the reduction in absolute numbers of incidents of severe disease for a two-year-old from wearing a mask? They have no 
clue. And that's why the World Health Organization says we don't want little kids at that age wearing masks. The ECDC, that's the European version of the CDC, um, they said we don't want kids in primary school wearing masks at all. But the United States, if you were to say, I'm not so sure this is a good idea for my six-year-old to be wearing a mask, again, you were some right-wing lunatic jerk, um, or you know, as I was referred to by that guy you were talking about yeah, before, yeah. That, that politician, that to even question this stuff, there's this fairly kind of like, it's this amazing, I think this American sort of like centrism that this inability to see what's happening elsewhere. And I'm like, as far as I'm aware, the kids in Europe are not all dead because they weren't wearing masks. There's no evidence that they were at any greater risk than the kids in America. Um, so, you know, and so from that to the vaccine policies where, you know, universities in, in, in America, many of the most elite universities have the most aggressive vaccine requirements for their students. Imagine you're a healthy 19 year old man. Maybe you've already had one or two doses of the vaccine. You've already had COVID once, maybe even twice. You've spoken to your doctor, you're aware of the evidence and you're saying, I don't think I need yet another vaccination. And you attend some elite university and they say, either you get another dose of this vaccine or you're out. Wow. I mean, and, and, and that is such, it's so harmful and so fascinating to me and troubling that we've come to this place. Um, and that, so I wrote a piece about this recently um, where there's an organization called FIRE, um, it's an acronym, but where, where they made a list of something like 200 universities in America and they ranked them based on their um, free speech environment. I think they interviewed something like 40,000 students. Um, FIRE, FIRE a civil liberties group. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I forget precisely what, what the letters stand for, but they, they did this survey, they've done it for a few years now, where they made a list and, and um, and when I saw that list in the back of my head, and I just glanced at it, I said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of seeing a correlation between the universities that are more open to free speech and a free exchange of ideas, and you see a correlation between them and what I suspect might be their policies toward vaccines. So I looked into it, and even the amount that I thought might exist, I was blown away. It was one-to-one. -one that the top five schools um, for the most, um, you know, the, the best free speech environments, no vaccine requirement at all. They all strongly encouraged it, but it wasn't required. The bottom five all required multiple vaccinations. The bottom two, Columbia University, um, and I think it was um, Penn, both required the bivalent booster or you're out. And so you have the bottom, the worst universities for free speech in the country also have the most aggressive vaccination policy. The best ones for, and, and it's just remarkable how you can see that. And almost all of the Ivy League universities are in, are, are in the bottom, the bottom like 20% uh, for free speech, according to that thing, and also have the same, you know, these same types of vaccine policies. Wow. Isn't that amazing? It's that sort of the, the, the these large themes, I feel like we can't escape them. There's something about, as you and I, as people who generally have been, have been or still are liberal, observing the kind of illiberalism yeah. of, of the left. Yeah. Um, so is there a correlation? So the, the, other, the universities, you didn't name any of the universities that are more pro-free speech mm. and more pro, you use the oh, term bodily autonomy, right? Yes, which, which, and it's interesting. Which is an interesting choice of well, words to use there. I, a good friend of mine, um, very far left guy, very smart. He's in, in DC politics. So, um, he wrote to me and he was very upset that I used that term. And I, I, and I admit, I actually didn't think about it very long. Um, I just threw it in there because obviously that's a very um, emotionally triggering phrase related to reproductive rights for women. And obviously that's different from that being vaccinated. But I wrote back to him and I said, look, you know, I hear you. Maybe I shouldn't have used that, that term. I don't know. Um, be, just because of the larger... So it wasn't intentionally provocative. But no, it wasn't. It's just because it, 
What could be more of an infringement on bodily autonomy than forcing a medical product to be injected into a young person that they don't want and that we know has zero or close to zero epidemiological benefit at this point? It doesn't stop infection or transmission. It may temporarily, there's a very ephemeral benefit of reducing the chance of getting infected, but it's, it, it vaporizes relatively quickly. And if someone already had COVID, their protection is just as robust, if not more so. There, this, there's not a strong scientific basis to justify forcing someone. So to me, bodily autonomy, even if that is a very loaded term, certainly in a technical sense, was very appropriate. Do you think you'd find a correlation if you also added uh, pro-life versus pro-choice into your metrics. So it wasn't just free speech, <laughs> vaccine, I mean, bodily autonomy. One, one would think, yeah. And, and I, am, I am as far pro-choice as someone can be. I'm, I, I, but to me, that aligns very much with also being pro-choice, quote unquote, for not being forced to be vaccinated for a vaccine that what they would call is non-sterilizing. It does not prevent infection. I think getting vaccinated is a good idea if you haven't been exposed to COVID and you want to reduce the likelihood of having a serious reaction to it. But that's your own decision in the same way that I don't go bungee jumping, because I, but someone else might want to do that. That's different from a social justification of you need to do this to protect others. You're and sounding awfully like a right-wing propagandist. Oh <laughs> <laughs> I'm, really I'm canceled. I'm out. <laughs> um, but so before getting into the uh, Twitter files experience, mm. I think one of the other things that uh, I, I maybe in the eyes of the other journalists on that project qualified you for it was your participation in the Great Barrington Declaration launch. And, and the last uh, guest I had on the show was Jay Bhattacharya, one of the co-authors. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, it's... it's um... <laughs> It's interesting, that is now both my sort of badge of honor and also, and then to other people, that is the mark of, of the beast, you know, um, that's, you know, multiple hit pieces written against me and people still tweet, you know, it, as a non sequitur, but I might, you know, tweet one thing and they say, you were at the Great Barrington Declaration and that that's, you know, I'm automatically the villain for being there. The, the funny thing is, I didn't even know there was such a thing. There, there would be a declaration. I was invited by Martin Kaldorf to come out. He said, Dave, you know, myself, Jay Bhattacharya, Sunetra Gupta, um, and um, Stefan Baral, who, who joined in uh, remotely. Um, he's at Johns Hopkins. He said, you know, why don't you come and, you know, interview us? And, and we want to present our side, our case, you know, for what we think is an appropriate response to the pandemic. Well, as did he tell you it was going to be advocating against lockdowns? Um, I, I or did think, it, it did just it, it was just as you just described. I don't it think there. he used necessarily used that terminology. I had interviewed Martin for an article that I wrote about um, in the states. I don't think this was very popular in England or throughout Europe. But they had this hybrid learning model where like you're in for two days a week, out for two days a week in the schools because they wanted them to be less crowded. And I interviewed Martin about that because there was a fair amount of evidence that that actually was going to increase the, the um, likelihood of transmission because while the kids weren't in school, an assumption was being made that they're just locked in their home. And while some kids were, um, many other kids, particularly from underprivileged families, where do you think they went? They went to a daycare. They went to some an elderly person's home who needed to take, to take care of them. So they were being exposed to tons of kids who weren't even in their, their bubble of their school, potentially, if you're into these other environments. So Martin and a few other people I had interviewed for the article said, this they've got this all wrong. This idea of this hybrid schooling, um, that this is going to make everyone safer. Not only do we not have evidence that it makes people safer, in fact, it may even be worse. So anyway, so I interviewed him for that. So already this was the contrarian you know, kind of idea. I don't know if we specifically talked about you know, so-called lockdowns, but I knew he had uh, um, a different perspective on what the CDC and Anthony Fauci and the government were telling us needed to be done with school closures and a variety of other things. So I knew this was going to be um, an event where I'm exposed to sort of, you know, I forget what, I think like in the military, where they have like the red team, they use they have the sort of like the alternative um, view is it, it was being proposed. And as a journalist, I mean, I was like, I'm there, of course, like this, 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 
I have the opportunity to interview these scientists from Stanford, Harvard, <laughs> I'm in Oxford. I think she's at Oxford. She is, yeah. yeah. Um, wow, this is amazing. So um, it was only after the fact, after I had interviewed them, that I found out they were putting together this, this you know, formal declaration. Um, so I guess the interesting thing is I was there because this seemed interesting to me, because I just wanted to be open to learning more. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I think Martin and Jay had tried to get some, some, some more journalists who are far more prominent than I am at, you know, sort of the more, you know, legacy publications. And I think they, they weren't interested. Um, I'm interested. Yeah. I'm, I'll talk to anyone. Um, so I went and that's what I've been doing from day one is I will talk to anyone what, and I'm always interested in hearing, well, what is the quote other side? What is there? It doesn't mean a false equivalency. It means if there's not strong evidence for what's happening, then we need to talk about this yeah. and try to think about what is the broader picture of what's going on. Well, particularly if you'd, you were seeing that, the, the, like you described early, earlier, the CDC avoiding the evidence against you know, the exactly. empirical truth. And, and there's this, look, if you are, if a doctor has a bias toward an intervention. If you're a surgeon, you want to operate. If you are, this is, you know, a natural thing. They want, and people who work in public health have a bias and it comes from a good place. They want to be useful. They, can you imagine Anthony Fauci saying, um, look, we are being presented with this, you know, horrible situation. I have to be honest with you, the American people, we don't have a lot of strong evidence about some of these measures, but I try wearing a mask. We'll see what will happen, but we're not certain. You know, we have to, if he was honest with people, if they said, we're not sure about what happens if you close schools for this duration of time, I think it would have been a very different conversation. I think but, the fir for the first lockdown, I think that that's pretty much people accept that it was worth, we didn't really under fully understand what's going on. It was worth taking right. extra precaution. So there's sort of two things going on here that we're talking about. One of them is the effectiveness of these various things, masks, lockdowns, vaccines. Um, and the other side is what are the, what are the harms of these things? So what was missing, and I know this is what Jay and Martin, you know, are so concerned about, um, what is, what was largely missing from the conversation was, well, what are the downsides? What are the harms? And when, for the FDA to approve a drug or some sort of medical intervention, typically you have to show safety and effectiveness. Um, and safety would incorporate, well, what are the harms of this thing? And you have to weigh everything out. Um, they didn't do that with these mitigations. And understandably, in you know March, the, the beginning or middle of March, there still was a fair amount of confusion. Okay, we're not sure what's going to happen. The safest thing to do, let's all take a moment, everyone stay home. That makes sense. That seems to, I think in retrospect, that wasn't necessarily correct in, in all but a very few places, perhaps, you know, including New York City, um, where there actually was an explosion of cases. But um, put, setting that, you know, setting that aside, the retrospective look that it probably wasn't even appropriate doing that, it was reasonable, even if not appropriate. I think where it became unreasonable was as the weeks and months kept wearing on, and then the burden of proof shifts and there was a lack of awareness of the harms being done. You have kids around America, we're talking about 50 or 60 million kids who are healthy, who are forced to stay home. Mm. That is an extraordinary moment that happened. Um, and that continued to happen. Kids in California, many of them in pockets of Virginia and elsewhere, did not set foot in a school building for a year. And some of these kids, and it wasn't just the schools, it was everything that went with it. The play dates with friends, you were, if you did that, you were crazy or some right-wing lunatic. It, the um, arts programs, athletics. I spoke to um, this guy who was running um, a youth football program um, in New York, and just the stories of these kids, this was their ticket mm. out. Mm. Their ticket out of out of a bad situation they were growing up in, and it was taken away from them like that. That so these, if you are a healthy kid, and 
you, you knew that the coronavirus, it's not zero, it's not that there was zero risk, but the risk was on par with any number of other risks that we face every day from getting in a car to, you know, um, something like 700 something kids drown every year. Mm. Um, but we still go swimming mm. because that's part of life. When we get on the highway, there's a reason why the speed limit is not 35 miles an hour. We accept some degree of risk in society for the benefits of doing different things. And that, that risk calculation was thrown out the window, I believe, in my view, and what I will argue extensively um, in my book on the topic, is that when you think about that you know, 16-year-old kid who is healthy, who is at extraordinarily low risk of this virus, and his life was essentially destroyed um, by what happened, that matters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, uh, so take me to, on your journey to San Francisco, you get the call from Barry, you're here in New York, uh, upstate, and you, you fly over at the drop of a hat, <laughs> right. snap of a finger, you arrive, you go downtown San Francisco, Twitter HQ. Mm -hmm. What's the atmosphere? What's going on? Well, the first thing I noticed, and boy, I'm going to, if I didn't sound like a right-wing person before, <laughs> that, um, get, get ready for this, everyone, hold your hat. Um, San Francisco, at least the part where Twitter is located, is just abysmal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, because I'm a, a New Yorker, mm -hmm. I've always walk everywhere. Um, and so the hotel I was at was about a mile, mm -hmm. I think, from Twitter. And in my mind, it, it, it's inconceivable to me when I go somewhere, I always like to walk no matter where. So it's inconceivable to me that I would take a, um, an Uber or something like that to get from a, a mile. I'm going to walk. Um, and as I walked down, it was just, I mean, there were literally people smoking meth on the street in front of me. It's just a bombed out pit, at least that part of the city. Yeah. Um, is that Mission District? Well, I think that's what it is. Yeah, it's yeah. like Marcus Street or something yeah, down yeah. there. So it was, it was so strange. I mean, it's far, far worse than New York. I mean, it's like a totally different scene. I was there in November yeah. uh, staying at a hotel near Union Square and I mm -hmm. saw someone take a shit in the middle of the street. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean... There, if it's I was there shocking. for a longer duration, I, I would have switched hotel or done something where I, it was like walking a gauntlet. Um, I don't really understand the dynamics of the, how the police work there or what happened. But I mean, you can't walk down at least that main thoroughfare without walking through people like freebasing meth <laughs> in front of you. So that was that was the yeah. that was the initiation. But I burst through. Yeah. And um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there was it was funny. I mean, this was all done. Um, I think what people, some people don't realize about the Twitter files, because I've seen lots of complaints. Why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do that? This was like kind of a, a, what I think Michael Schellenberger called. Um, he was one of the, the journalists there. I mean, I think he called it a smash and grab. I mean, this was like very spur of the moment. Barry is not the New York Times. She's she's starting this kind of media empire, but she's still, you know, a small thing. So this was all just being done in the moment. I think like at 10 o'clock the night before I was supposed to go in, I'm texting Barry, hey, um, how do I get in? How do I? She's like, oh, let me, let me text the security people. So I had to get through multiple layers of security, this whole thing, you know, um, and eventually I get in there and myself, Michael Schellenberger, Lee Fong, who's a journalist, and Leighton Woodhouse, um, the four of us were there. I was there for three days. Some of them, they, those guys all live in the Bay Area, I think, so they, they were there um, longer, either before and or after. But I was there with the three of them and we were in a room um, with the shades were drawn. The door was to remain closed at all times. Um, and, um, you know, this was this is a very, very touchy um, operation for multiple reasons, not the least of which was um, I think there was a lot of legal implications about what was happening. So there was an engineer who was assigned to us who sat at a laptop in the room and he conducted um, searches for us, looking at um, basically anyone, any profile of any person we wanted to look at, we, we could tell him. And I'm looking over his shoulder. He's, you know, typing it in, looking them up, and um, and you could see um, whether there were different sort of like flags on their on their account. Um, and and so while I was there, I knew just from reporting on this for for the past several years, I knew of so many instances um, of 
legitimate, correct information that was nevertheless suppressed in one way or another. Um, so I wanted to go there to sort of like reverse engineer. I wanted to deconstruct and understand how did this happen? Um, so that was my mission when I was there, which I think perhaps was slightly different from what some of the other um, reporters were doing there. But I wanted to deconstruct how and why, um, if I could get to the why, but at least the how of, of this, these types of tweets and information, how was it suppressed and, and how did this happen? Because we all had an inkling about it. We all That's pretty right. much knew it was right. And then what was so exciting is when this stuff came out, the Twitter files was like, oh yeah, see, I'm not crazy. What but exactly? So, so did you what find out the how? So, so the way I view it is there sort of were several things happening at once, which is um, at the top, there's people making decisions and some accounts were um, were suppressed or people were even suspended because executives at Twitter made that choice. There also was something happening where there were um, these bots that they created, you know, it's sort of almost through like an AI or machine learning process where they kind of, and I'm going to use the wrong term, I'm sure, for the tech people, but they were essentially crawling, you know, and searching throughout the, the, the platform to see if there are any tweets that triggered these bots to, to flag them. So the and bots were trained to that's correct. search out It's an the algorithm, essentially, that was trained to look for a specific type of content. Uh -huh. And then the last thing, so there's these three areas. You have people, you have bots, and then you have um, these sort of independent contractors in places like the Philippines who were deciding, who were looking at this stuff. And, and I explain in my reporting um, how each of these things worked. But in the end, it all comes back to people because people decide how those bots are supposed to function. And people decide, these executives at Twitter decide how some guy sitting in a cube farm halfway across the world, and they were given these decision trees that they get a, a, a tweet, I guess, that for one reason or another, maybe a bot flags the tweet, and then it goes to the contractor sitting in a cube who then is looking at this tweet, and they go through a decision tree. Does it say this, yes or no? And then depending on that, and it takes you through you know, where, how they were supposed to get to their ultimate decision. Um, and what I tried to, to articulate in my reporting on this was, there is no way that a guy sitting at a desk in the Philippines is going to be able to adjudicate the accuracy or the legitimacy of a tweet by a doctor about myocarditis. That's just not happening. So you ended up with this situation where you had, um, people with legitimate content. Martin Koldorf, I, I cited one of his tweets um, that I highlighted in there, where it was flagged as misleading. And this is a guy who is an expert from Harvard University, who, um, who is stating his opinion about, uh, and, and nevertheless, it was flagged as misleading. Mm -hmm. And I had multiple instances of physicians and even regular people who were quoting, um, quoting from peer-reviewed journals. Um, they were quoting actual, now uh, someone could quibble about maybe the journal itself, you know, this wasn't a well done study. It doesn't matter. This is stuff from accredited journals and those were labeled as misleading. They were, um, some of these accounts were suspended. There was a, a woman who, um, not a doctor, a regular citizen who was quoting data from the CDC. Her tweet got flagged. So I, deconstructed about how this happened through the bots, through the independent contractors, and then ultimately through the executives at Twitter making these choices on what to do with this type of content. So is the incompetence of an incompetent system or a malfunction or a weak system is part of it. But there's the, the people aspect is interesting because this is, seems to still be somewhat debatable as to whether they are ideologically Ben, and, and you've shown data that actually overwhelmingly they are of one political uh, thought or philosophy. Um, uh, and I'm, I, I want to understand their motivation. Why, why are they making certain d decisions? And another aspect which is probably linked is, is, is the, how they were working with government on this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, how would you sort of describe or how would you explain what was going on there? So... One of the things that I found was um, an email from an executive named Lauren Colbertson, where she described what had happened. And this happened with the Trump White House, too. Um, but there was far more information about the Biden 
um, White House, where they were um, having meetings regularly with the social media platforms. And they, the Biden White House made it very clear, she characterized them as being, quote, very angry that Twitter had not deplatformed um, a number of users um, who, according to um, the White House, were tweeting false information or misleading information. So we know that the executive branch of the government essentially had their boot on the neck of these people at Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and to their credit, what I observed over and over again at Twitter, to almost in every instance, were people who were genuinely struggling and debating about what to do. So the system you described, I think, was, was flawed. But when the people were having conversations about this, they oftentimes pushed back against the government. These were these were people who were doing the best they could, I think, and they weren't sure, you know, under the directives given to them, either by the you know people at the top of Twitter or you know indirectly by the government. And I've heard some people say, "Well, the government's just asking." I mean, that is an incredibly um, naive position to take about how the world functions. If you run a multi-billion dollar company and you have um, people from the White House, you know, winking at you and saying, we sure would like you to do this, yeah. you know, but we're just asking. I mean, these are people who are, you know, in charge of regulating your particular company and your industry. That that matters when they're quote asking you to do something on your platform. It's it's I can sort of see when it comes to the issue of COVID how this it was so distressing for everyone wherever whatever you sort of thought about it where those are difficult decisions to make. But there were also political decisions made and 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 Barry showed that there was suppression of conservative voices, the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop, removing Trump from Twitter after Jan six. There was uh, overwhelmingly anti conservative. Uh, suppression of speech going on on a Twitter, which is it's harder to sort of be sympathetic to that because it seems so against American values, so against the First Amendment and, and Bill of Rights. So do you think that still applies? That sort of, you seem almost empathetic with the, the people uh, well, at Twitter. Well, I'm empathetic with a lot of the people who worked there who maybe this wasn't their choice. Um, I have, I'm even, you know, and I'm sympathetic toward even the executives who decided to follow along with what the White House is telling you. Um, I have less sympathy toward the government who was, you know, kind of leaning on them for this. And I have less sympathy toward the idea that, you know, you don't, no one wants to be on a social media platform where anything goes, where it's just this like cesspool of like, you know, um, you know violence and porn and, you know. Um, so there is some sort of gray area between, well, how do we regulate this environment my personal take on it is you need to lean toward latitude, toward um, allowing as much as possible, including things that may be incorrect. It's far better. It's sort of like a rough analogy would be, you know, the, the uh, legal system in America, you know, with um, uh, you're considered, you know, uh, not guilty. You know, and, and yeah. you know, and to, uh, rather than they don't say innocent, they say not guilty. Mm -hmm. That there's this burden of proof. I'd much rather err on the side of of allowing more things mm -hmm. because it's better to have sunlight than it is to have darkness. Mm -hmm. It is better to have and let the, the best ideas win out. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that completely outlandish, crazy stuff should be allowed on there. And I don't know where the line should be drawn. But what I do know is from what I observed and what I wrote about is that having doctors quote from studies from peer reviewed journals having their tweets nevertheless taken down having their accounts suspended is a horrible totally unacceptable situation um and ultimately and i and this is you know winding its way through the courts right now what some lawyers argue is that this was essentially a violation of First Amendment rights by proxy. Yes, the government didn't go to someone's house and take their MacBook and smash it over their knee, but by leaning on the platforms, by telling them what they wanted, what type of content they thought was unacceptable, by proxy, they essentially were infringing on their First Amendment rights. That's at least the legal argument. I don't know, you know how that will work out in the courts, but I think certainly from a kind of um, in the spirit of that law, even if it's not the letter of the law, that's what to me seems to be the case. With regards to the court and, and it, as, as you suggest, it's, it's the House Oversight and Accountability Committee that's going to, what is the significance of that? Is, is 
the, 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 the Republicans have the majority in, in Congress, not in the Senate. So even if, let's say, they push this through, is it just going to end as soon as it hits the, the Senate? What, what, what does, it, does it really matter? So it's interesting. I mean, I think it matters. It's good that this, at least that some people are being held accountable, or at least publicly um, held accountable insofar as this is being discussed publicly in in the you know seat of government. Um, I think ultimately, you're right. I mean, un- unless there is a real bipartisan desire for this, um, I think there's- Which there isn't. Which there is not. It's or, still a joke, really, even so it's amongst, interesting. amongst the Democrats, it seems A handful of, of, um, of some infectious disease doctors, epidemiologists. Um, there's an infectious disease person I know at, um, at NIAID, that's Fauci's old agency. A handful of these people um, reached out to me and they were saying, we really want there to be um, a COVID-19 commission in the way there was like a 9-11 commission that happened. This notion of like a bipartisan sort of thing. And I said, you know, and I said, guys, I got to tell you, um, even if there is more media coverage of this idea, unless the politicians really want to do it, you know, I don't think it's going to happen. And number one, number one, number two, I think even if there is a commission, the same dynamics that led to all the problems in the pandemic, I suspect will also plague the commission. The same, you know, what we call like zero COVID people, the same kind of wrong thinking people who had bad ideas during the pandemic, they're going to be consulted again for the commission. So I I have a lot of um, pessimism about A, whether that'll even happen or B, even if it does, I, I don't know. There's a lot of people who want some sort of reckoning to happen. I don't think that's going to happen ever. Mm-hmm. I think all we can do is, or at least when I say, I guess I'm speaking for myself, is to continue to try to write about what I investigate and what I observe to be true and bring that to as many people as I can. And um, I, I don't think there will be some sort of big reckoning. But where David, as an American, <laughs> does that not concern you that there's been such breaches against the First Amendment and that there won't, you just don't think there'll be a reckoning? And what does that mean for the future of this country? I mean, you know, I, I think I've just become, I was, I've always been cynical, but I think now it's just, I, I think there are unfortunately limits to, I think a lot of these things sound good in theory, but in practice. And let's be honest, the people on the right, they, they happen, I happen to align with them about a lot of the, the, what happened during the pandemic, but I don't align with them on a variety of other issues. Um, and I don't think that they're, you know, the heroes necessarily in this either. Um, I don't want to take away from them what having largely what I believe to be the correct view on a lot of the policies. So I'm not saying saying that those weren't sincerely held, but I think that, you know, this is complicated stuff. Beyond, although I was a political science major in college. <laughs> nevertheless, this is, you know, beyond my um, ability to really understand or talk about about what's going to happen we have a what seems to be you know and this is a total banal you know kind of cliche at this point we have a broken system there are two parties um they both people are tribal uh-huh. and you know you're on a team or the b team i had a, i had to talk with um andrew yang about this a guy who is you know a pretty prominent um Dom- running, democratic uh, yeah position. but he was I, I, but he but he believes in this kind of third party idea uh-huh. and for whatever complex mix of reasons that never really has caught on in America. But I think this sort of binary system um, creates this, you know, a, a series of bad incentives. The type of people who become senators and Congress people, let alone a president, those type of people tend to, you know, want to be in power. Otherwise you wouldn't, you don't get there by accident. You get there because there's something in your personality that thinks, yeah, yeah, I yeah. should be in charge. You know, it's a personality type. And so those type of people, I think, are going to be highly um, incentivized to do what's going to work best for them and within their tribe. So you have this system. I think it's just what we're going to be left with. But, you know, all I can do as a writer and a thinker is to try to create what I hope is a document of what happened um, and create a document of the evidence. And, and so, I mean, that's what I'm doing with the book that I'm working on now. That, What's the name of the book? So the book is called An Abundance of Caution. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was a phrase that was used all the time yeah. in the beginning of the pandemic. Out of an abundance of caution, 
We're closing schools and out of an abundance of caution, we're going to do what they called a deep cleaning. I never got a, got a clear uh, definition of what a deep cleaning is versus <laughs> regular cleaning, but everything was out of an abundance of caution. Uh -huh. but, but, but the question is, caution toward what? And it was caution toward a virus, but not cautionary toward all of these other things. And this is what Martin and Jay, you know, have, have talked about all along is that there are harms that happen. Yeah. And importantly, and this is the important part for, for liberals to understand, the harms were disproportionate to poor people and to black people and to other people who were not in the same socioeconomic um, environment as people in the laptop class, yeah, as yeah, we would yeah. call them. So that's the, the painful irony yeah. of this to me, is that these policies disproportionately harmed the people that ostensibly, at least, progressives and liberals care about helping the most. If I can bring you back just one last time to the Please. San Francisco. Mm. Supposedly, there's a lot that hasn't been made public. Can you give us any <laughs> tidbits, any, any, anything that really surprised you or shocked you that, hasn't, that we don't know about? That the, the, the presumably, there's just tons more to, to be investigated. So I was there for three days uh -huh. and it was very hard to do the searching that I was doing. And I was there, Michael Schellenberger and Lee and, and Leighton, they helped me at times. We were all helping each other, but I was like, guys, I, I need help. So we, we were given dumps of 5,000 emails, you know, at a clip and, and that required- How'd you get through that? I mean, reading, a lot, you know, I'm just seeing there quickly scrolling through, doing word searches, like trying to, to wade With through- With your engineer sat next to you. Yeah, so the engineer was searching. Um, he performed searches on people's accounts, and then they had a different system where if we wanted to see Slack channel communications or emails, that was done on a separate special laptop that they did the searches outside the room. We would have to email like them, send them, this is what we want. They would perform the search, and then they'd bring in the laptop mm -hmm. with, with it, was, it was like a crazy system. Um, so it, it was, Sorry, this is a long answer to your question, which is what I found is what I was able to find within the amount of time I was there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what else is there. So I've, there, there's nothing that I've seen. I wish I had like a great secret. <laughs> there's nothing I've seen that's like incredible that, that I was told to withhold. As a matter of fact, I just want to state very clearly and publicly, I had zero um, constraints placed on me. Elon Musk did not pick me. He didn't tap me on the shoulder. So when people are like, yeah, Elon Musk, that's not true. Um, he had given access to Barry Weiss and Barry Weiss asked me to come out. Um, the only stipulation, there's no NDA, there's nothing. The only stipulation was you need to publish on Twitter first, whatever you find. But other than that, there was no limitations placed on what we could look for or what we could publish. Uh -huh. um, um, so, uh, well, on that note, on that um Fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, I, I guess um, I, uh, listeners will want to know how they can follow you, uh, uh, where they can read your work, and um, uh, keep stay tuned with the the, the world of David Zweig. Yes, yes. So um, I have a website, davidzweig.com. I'm on Substack, um, so I'm easy to find there under my name there, and um, and I'm still writing for a variety of places, my own Substack, and and most importantly the book that I'm working on. So it's a very people. It's funny for a y years now. I keep getting you know, and thank God for my editor who's allowing me to blow by all of my deadlines. But what I'm trying to create, as I said before, is this sort of historical document, um, this this thing that's going to actually describe maybe in a decade from now, someone will look back and be like, oh, okay, that's, that's what was going on. Um, and I think the element of, because of, it's just tying into with you saying, where can people find you, um, is how the media in, it was so influential um, in this whole environment that happened. And to me, as someone part of the media, yet also I view myself as an outsider as well. Um, I'm, I've occupied this strange space of the insider-outsider where I've been writing for places like The Atlantic or The New York Times and New York Magazine, um, but yet writing from an angle that was largely um, not seen, I think, from a lot of those publications. So um, 
I think there's this, this larger story about how the media affects us as a society and both reflects what's happening, but also, of course, you know, projects um, and influences what happens. So all of that stuff gets bundled together um, in a way that's perpetually frustrating, but also fascinating. <laughs> it sounds a very important book and actually continues to look at just how the Twitter files were covered by the mainstream media. If they were covered, it's the same The same thing continued. I hope that you also write a book about your experiences um, there. I will say, is the, last, the, Twitter, the last I checked, my thread on Twitter had more than 60 million views. And to my knowledge, it was completely ignored by any mainstream news outlet. And even if the editors and writers there think that the information, what they called was a nothing burger, this term, oh, this isn't important, they're not really showing, which I, I would vehemently <laughs> disagree with, even if you think it's not important, the fact that this investigative reporting was viewed by 60 million people yeah. means that that in and of itself, it has some newsworthiness. What does that tell us that it was completely ignored. Remarkable, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, David Zweig, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you. This is terrific. Mm -hmm.